welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, Liv, here with more incredibly fun and weird and interesting content on just women. Real women, mythological women, something kind of in between. <sighs> Did I say my name already? I'm not listening back. I'm Liv, the only person who ever starts talking in these episodes, and yet I introduce myself every time because you never know. You never know. Today I am here, oh my gosh, with a conversation episode with Dr. Carla Ionescu, who is the Artemis expert. Carla and I have been internet friends for some time now and have been trying to make this work for so long and then like honestly even months ago I was like I want to have you on but it's not gonna air until March and thankfully actually we didn't record ahead of time which sometimes is helpful because it makes things sound more relevant like how in today's episode on Artemis all things Artemis but specifically Artemis in the real world that's what I really wanted to emphasize today and what I wanted to pick Carla's brain about I wanted Artemis in the real world, how real women of ancient Greece worshipped Artemis, what that looked like, what we know and what we don't know, how that interacted with the extremely patriarchal Athens, because one of the main and most interesting and the best cult that we focus on when it comes to Artemis worship in this episode is this cult from Brauron, which is very close to Athens. It is in Attica. And so the women who were involved with worshiping Artemis at this cult, like would have been Athenian. And so would have been part of the incredible strictures that were put on Athenian women. And yet, and yet this cult of worship involved girls who were like coming close to marriageable age, traveling to Brauron and behaving like bears. Behaving like bears, uh, like a, a rite of passage kind of thing before you kind of give up your wildness for to be a woman at home, which is an enormous bummer, but we can focus on the behaving like bears part. There's like 12 year old girls behaving like bears. Anyway, uh, we get into it. Oh, this was such a fun conversation. So many things, Artemis and goddess worship. Broadly, we had such a great time. Uh, And Carla also has her own podcast and so much more to do with Artemis that is available. You can find links in the episode description and it is mentioned at the end of the episode as always. But honestly, it was such a joy. You will also hear a lot of inspiration for the episode from two weeks ago that I did on parthenogenesis in women and the stingray. This, along with the other episodes that are coming this month and which have already been released, uh, was heavily influential when it comes to that episode because I just started thinking about what came before. (sighs) But truly, this episode is such a joy, so I will not keep rambling, and I will just let you dive right into it with me and Carla. And oh my god, (sighs) Artemis. Maybe she's my new obsession. I don't know. Like I needed another one, right? Conversations. Better off with bears, Artemis and goddess worship with Dr. Carla Ionescu. I would love to hear mostly about like real people interacting with her because like I can access all the, you know, primary sources for the mythology itself and I love her but I know that she is just so right in terms of like the real life worship like I'm thinking of Browron uh and the cult there and really like anything to do with you know like how she was actually worshipped um like yeah. daily I would I would love so much <laughs> yeah I think actually I think that's a really great way of looking at her I'm not sure that she's really been looked at in that way for a long long time like, I think she's often dismissed. I mean, that's one of my pet peeves that she's often dismissed. The maiden huntress, you know. And they love I, the word virgin. Virgin. Right? <laughs> they like love this, it. <laughs> this, this virgin huntress. And I think when I started my PhD, I was both excited and also a little bit, like, 
shocked that she was ignored so much for so long uh, among classicists. You know, there's a standard sort of plays and things like that. But uh, as I dug deeper and deeper, I was like, wait, this goddess is like fierce. She's mag- you know, she's magnificent. She's massive. She's all these words, you know? Uh, and I think what I realized is that she is actually a goddess that pertains to women so deeply that early scholars didn't really find much interest in her. So, you know, we have- Surprise, Effie, surprise. Right? Like, <laughs> Sorry, I'm know, just like, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no. wow. <laughs> I mean, it's shocking. Like, you know, so we have Athena for war and it's like, woohoo. And then we have Aphrodite for love and sex. And it's like, woohoo, right? And all these other goddesses. And then Artemis is like, oh yeah, like she hunts, I think. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> She's a virgin, so we care <laughs> a little less. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I don't know that they, they didn't know really where to put her. And- um, when I started digging and digging, I thought, oh, wow, she was really the people's goddess. And so I have this now almost like a life passion, a life journey. This, you know, she's become my life pretty much. Um, and everywhere I go, she tends to show up and be like, hey, don't forget to tell this story. Um, and so I find her fascinating. And yes, yeah, so now she's, and so that led to like me trying to open this Artemis Center. And then, so in the beginning, I'm like, okay, I'm opening the Artemis Center. We're going to do courses on the goddess. Okay, so wait, all- I didn't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> I know you as the Artemis expert, but I did not know beyond that. Yes, yes. So I wanted to build a place, what's well, virtual now, I wanted to build a place where women can come without doing like a classics degree or a PhD, just come and learn about the goddess, several goddesses, but Artemis, of course, being central. And so that was sort of the first call. And I started that a couple of years ago online, and now we're doing workshops and courses and things like that. But now, more and more lately, it feels like something tangible for her needs to be done. And so I'm leaving for Crete in April, and I think I'm going to build an actual temple to her. Like, I think I'm going to, like, (laughs) do it, like, the old ways and literally build a brick-and-mortar space. I have, like, this vision of it, and bears have been plaguing me. And um, so it's my my long-term goal. But there's something about it, and it's not just me. Like, there's something in the air. There's There's a phenomenon of, like, women coming forward and saying, oh my God, Artemis, I've always connected with her. Or Artemis, I want to learn more about her. This is the right time for her to come. And so so it's not just me in the sense of like, I'm not just out here, although I felt like it was just me for a long time, you know, in the, in the isolation of academia. But now it seems that people are thirsty for this, this goddess. I mean, I mean, people are thirsty for goddesses, like absolutely, yes. you know, if if I've learned anything by stumbling into this career, it's that people really like to learn about Greek mythology, but particularly goddesses, like, I mean, I've spent the last 10 years or not 10, God, close though, almost seven years, like talking about, you know, women in the ancient world and Greek goddesses so specifically, and like, it, it, it just keeps being proven that people want to hear that because like what you're saying earlier about you know, how she'd been kind of looked over in favor of the other goddesses. Like, I just think it's so interesting to look at the goddesses that do have like a lot of representation in terms of like classic scholarship in the last, yeah, like you said, you know, like er, like earlier when it was all the dudes, right? Yeah. Like, because like, okay, they like Aphrodite. Ooh, big surprise. Like the men, like the sexy one who's like known for be- being beautiful, but then also Athena and like, Athena's to me track so directly to the ancient world like the men loved her then too and she was like very much the man's goddess the hero's goddess like you know they they gave her all of these masculine qualities and like obviously you know there's nothing wrong with that but when you see the way it tied to her importance compared to others like it's a bummer and I think about like Artemis and particularly well it's actually funny I I hopping onto this call I'd stopped finishing edits uh, on on a conversation that's going to drop on Friday actually with um with an author about a new novel about Demeter because Demeter is another really good example of these goddesses that have been kind of overlooked or in the course in the case of Demeter you know it's just all about how she was like sad looking for her daughter like she doesn't have a lot right. of like strength and same with Artemis bizarrely even though she's like iconically a strong and important goddess right but yeah, it was like lady problems, like keep her over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that for so long she was associated with, she became associated with childbirth and marriage and things like that, which she was. And I don't, there's no, there's no shame in that, so to speak. You know what I mean? But it, 
I think it lacked interest for a lot of early classicists. And I think what it lacked or is their ability to understand the power of that. Yeah. You know, right? Like the building of community among women around, let's say, birthing. Like you don't have to birth to be in the community of birthing. And you don't have to birth a child to be in the community of raising children. Like, so this is a foundational goddess, you know, a goddess who's like literally on the pulse of society. And yet I think early, certainly early authors were like, yeah, she's hunting in the woods, you know, with her deer. And this whole sort of community, dare I say, a kind of hidden matriarchy, although that's not the right terminology, but a hidden, you know, a, a support group for women, a time just for women, um, surrounding, you know, whatever their experience was in the world, was sort of dismissed. And I think that that was their mistake, because this is actually a very powerful aspect of both Athenian culture, who very much was centered around birthing citizens, yeah. uh, right? Yeah. For like just human <laughs> culture who, you know, requires at least this, you know? Yeah. 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 Oh. <laughs> I love when these like I recorded a conversation with a with someone a couple of days ago and I just love when they they all completely end up aligning like in these ways that I never kind of see coming because we uh, talked about women as vessels in the ancient world and like so much like lots to do with that um but that yeah (laughs) it reminds me of that too just even the way you said like well the Athenians were concerned with birthing citizens (laughs) like yeah they weren't as concerned with you know women or that's maybe putting it kindly even (laughs) um but they were certainly concerned with citizens and one thing that i i don't think about enough but came up the other day is like they were so concerned with with paternity which is so interesting too and like looking at those fears um i don't think necessarily aligns with artemis directly but like i now i kind of can't stop thinking about that that like fear of paternity and how it how it shows itself in mythology you know yes. like because you can just be like well I'm not sure that the kid is mine but maybe it's Zeus's if it's not you know and that wouldn't be right. so bad yes yes yeah so this is what I mean I mean this is something that was central to their lives and there's there's one goddess that's in charge of that or certainly home life and women's lives and making sure that women transit or transform from wild girls to marriage of women you know so these key factors in, let's say, an Athenian woman's life, but many other Greek women's lives as well. And yet for so long, she sort of disregarded. Now, for me, I tend not to lean too much on that patriarchal structure sometimes. I'm like, yeah, okay. They gave up their wildness to Artemis. And I feel like that's a later adaptation. Good. Um, I think the connection between bears. Now, I don't know. I've been reading this fantastic book called um, The Woman Who Married the Bear. Uh, it's really great. It's it's about mythology in Europe and in North America indigenous culture, in which women literally marry bears, and they became the wives of bears. That, that that's amazing. And but I, I also just have to. So I now all I can think of is um, there was this book in the eighties called Bear, um, and I think it's like Marianne Engel, something like that. Yes. And and it's basically about that and was like yes. pretty controversial because I'm pretty sure she almost she doesn't I don't know. Anyway, there's a lot going on uh with yeah. the woman romancing a bear. And so that's that's really all <laughs> you can think yeah. of in that moment. But yeah, yeah. like I, guess, I mean I guess there's there's more there than I would have ever kind of put together separately. <laughs> oh my god, Liv, there is so much. There is so much. Uh, wow. Like there's literal uh for example in indigenous North American culture. Uh, there's a scholar named Barbara Mann. She's really fantastic, and she's part of the indigenous culture, and she she does a lot of writing on bears. And one of the things she talks about is this cave, the idea of the cave, and that women in the 15,000 years ago, I mean, we're talking about a long, long time ago, 10, 15,000 years ago, would go into the caves, and people, actually, entire communities would go into the caves and live with the bears, like, in a common relation, not not an intimate sexual relationship, but yeah. in a common relationship. But she says in the mythology, there's overlap there. Like women would give birth to bear cubs hmm. or half bear, half bear. Like there's lots of mythology and she goes over lots of mythology. And yeah. then there's another scholar that talks about similar things in the Sami culture in Northern Europe and the Finn culture and all that. And again, we see a ton of bears mating with women, marrying women, protecting women, this idea that 
bears go into the cave to hibernate is sort of this idea of going into the womb, the cosmic womb, and that they stay in there for like the whole winter, which is kind of like, you know, the pregnancy process. And that when they come out, they have cubs. So there's this kind of birthing cosmological idea, right? Um, and this is probably, I would say, the essence of Artemis the bear in Buran. Yeah. Because Greeks used to also have lots of bears. I mean, there used to be lots of bears in Greece, you know, 5,000 years ago. Yeah. Um, well, I'm already thinking of Callisto and, uh, and Atalanta, right? Like, they also have these kind of bear origin stories. Yes. And so wow. the more I read about the bears... The more I'm fascinated, now Gibutas, of course, did a lot of work in with artifacts where she found a lot of artifacts that were half like head of bear, body of woman, or like this combination of a bear mother. And that, and so, you know, the word bear, for example, in Germanic culture means to birth or hmm. to bear, to carry. Well, but I guess it doesn't, I mean, English, it, it, I mean, it means the same too. Interesting. Kind of, right? Like to carry, well, yeah, like to bear when you, weight. But you bear a child yes. and it's the same spelling. Yes. Or like, oh. like if you bear down, you know, yeah. to birth to a child. Yeah. yeah. And so, so the first time I went to Buran, which was like in 2006, there was no one there. There was no one there. And it was very hard to get any information. They had a little uh, museum to it. And it was very hard to get information, particularly local information around that area. Mm. And so I knew the usual stuff. You know, there were rituals done here. There was a connection to bears that I could never put my finger on. I was like, I don't understand. I know Artemis is connected to deer. I don't understand where this connection to bear comes from, right? And no one was really talking about this this whole bear. Well, maybe marrying bears was not really something acceptable at the time. <laughs> you know? Valid. <laughs> fine (laughs) (laughs) and so they were talking about these 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 playing bears and young girls playing bears and I thought that's a random thing to do why bears why not goats right I mean goats are quite stubborn I love goats and they're certainly all over Greece (laughs) right Greece knows goats (laughs) and so so the first time it was a little bit hard to first of all nobody knew where the site was it was chaos I walked for miles and miles in the heat Anyways, I finally got there and they were really, they were trying their best to help, but they didn't have as much information. And so then I started digging on my own and things like that. The second time I went, there was more willingness to like have a discussion with locals. And so I met a couple of locals that were talking about how this place at Buran was a place of birthing, which probably is not surprising, but um, women would come there and they did ritual, secret rituals which we do not have written down, around birthing. And I thought, okay. And then one of the locals was saying to me, you know, it used to have 40 columns. There used to be 40 columns around the site, one for each week of pregnancy. Huh. I was like, okay, that's really fascinating. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of mystery around what exactly they did around birthing or even around menstruation or menorah or whatever. Um and so the idea was that there's power in this bleeding time, in this liminal time, um, and that the priestesses of Iran, and particularly of Phigenia, were not writing down or were not sharing women's secret rights, which is, is common across, right? Like Demeter and Persephone at Eleusis and other kind of stuff. Yeah. For, but at Iran, I think because it was seen as a birthing space, it didn't really get enough... Um, attention and yeah. so then it leaves us now to take a look at it and go what was going on here what is this thing that they sh- that young women shed at Buran and become bears and play wild things um before they are sort of restricted or constricted into marriage yeah right yeah which breaks our hearts a little bit because Artemis of the wild becomes almost Artemis of restriction. Yeah. And we're told that, you know, the arc toy, the, the, the young she bears leave their robes for Artemis, leave their toys for Artemis. So there, and I think that's very much, of course, a patriarchal development, perhaps in order for women to continue their secret rights, they had to blend into. Yeah. Right. Make them political. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think about that kind of stuff so often when 
when it comes to these things about women in the ancient world, because obviously like, you know, ar- archeological evidence is going to be something else, but in terms of written sources, like it's just so through the, the eyes and thoughts of men that we just have no idea what yeah. could have really been happening there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's interesting for that specifically because it's not a mystery cult, right? Like a, you know, quote unquote official mystery cult. Like it's more of just like, it was just a cult of worship. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, and we, they have that for every four year procession from Iran to Athens. Hmm. Uh, so they, so there is a little temple on the Acropolis to Artemis Baronia. Mm-hmm. And I've been to the Acropolis, I don't know how many times, and I always miss it. Yeah, I so. was going to say, I've been, I can't, I don't even want to try to count how many times, yeah. how many 40 euros I've spent <laughs> going up there. That's right. Wow. That's right. And I always miss it. And, uh, I haven't been up there in a few years, but but now I'm going back uh, to Greece this summer and I'm going to go and see where the spot is because from what I've spoke to others who have been up there, they're like, I don't know. I don't think it's labeled. I don't, I don't think, think it's, it's there. I don't, I don't think it's, it's labeled. So I think I'm going to do a whole video. Yeah, like, pl- I mean, what is I, going on here? <laughs> I can't wait. Uh, <laughs> I would like to see that. I was there in January. And uh, granted, I was not like I've been up there so many times that I don't. I just kind of like go to just kind of make sure that I'm there. Right. Um, but yeah, now I'm, I mean, I'm very curious. Yeah. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. And I've seen in other museums, you know, where they have the replicas of the Acropolis. And every single time I've seen them, I very rarely see the little spot for Artemis of Baronia. Yeah. So it's, it's almost, you know, and so I think that that's part of my mission, too, is like to raise awareness at the fact that they did this for so I mean, if you've ever been to Verona or Buran, it's they say, oh, it's just outside of Athens. But if you were walking it, it would take your whole day, if not longer. Yeah. Right. So if you have a procession over four years that starts in Baronia, which actually just outside of Baronia, there's a town called Artemis, which is so cool. Right. So I recommend that everyone go to beach town, go have fun. I was um, going to say, is it on, is Buran on the coast? Yeah. It's right okay. on the water. Right. Yeah. It's, so, Yeah. I'm trying to think about it. That's such a big area and it's so mountainous too. Like, yes. I think we often forget we talk about like, yeah, like these processions or even like Eleusis and stuff. And I mean, I think that's definitely like flatter because it's mostly on that like lower coastline. I mean, obviously it would have been different back then anyway, but, but like all of Attica is pretty fucking mountainous. So yes. like that takes a lot to do this yes. procession. Yes. And have this massive procession of Athenians and like all the Greeks wanted to participate from Buran to, you know, the Acropolis, so climbing up to the Acropolis. And, and so to me, that seems like something that was significant and that really played a key role in the identity of Athenian women or of young women or all of the women that were able to participate. It's unclear who was really able to participate. We know for sure, obviously, citizens were non-citizens. It's a little bit unclear. Right. Um, and that's, I think, the problem for a lot of women's history is that we don't have the data. Because yeah. <laughs> no one cared until now. <laughs> and now we're all just lost. <laughs> I just, I think, you know, a part of me thinks that, okay, so I have this group, this, we're doing this workshop called the Goddess Migration. So we've been talking about mi- the migrating goddesses. And one of my students was said something that was really fascinating. And she said, what if they had, what if the women who were participating for generations in these rituals, let's say, had assumed that we, 2,000 years later, would know from the artifacts and from what they left us what to do. But yet no one could predict that we would be so knocked off kilter by patriarchy that we as women today have almost no connection back. Like we're now trying to reach back and figure out what happened. And I thought, yeah, maybe they took it for granted that the stories would be passed down. Yeah. Unbroken. Yeah. Right? And that we would know what, I don't know, this river positioned over here and 40 columns and this kind of stuff means. Um, and now we're kind of looking back and going, we lost a little bit of that, right? We were, we were disconnected and yeah. all we have is men's interpretation of what was going on. They weren't even there. Yeah. You know, I mean, Aristophanes is writing about it and he doesn't <laughs> even know what the hell he's talking about, you know? I mean, he he's also... Words- <laughs> That guy, that guy <laughs> just sometimes. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so, anyways, it's it's been. I think it's the time. It's the time to start uncovering and start reaching back. Yeah. Um, 
how accurate can we get to the rituals that were performed there? I'm not sure. 100%. Yeah. Um, among Greek women today, they also are hesitant to share because the Greek Orthodox Church has still such influence. Yeah, well, I was going to say like, and, and this is less about, you know, Greek Orthodox, more so about like, you know, the just sort of the Western world broadly, but the combination yeah. of of the patriarchy and Christianity like really just meant that we'll, we'd lose everything. Right. Like, you know, they, they lived in the patriarchy then. So they would have at least had some kind of like, like, yeah, like this hope though, that it would have been passed on anyway, but at least they had this like grounding in what it meant to live in this patriarchal world, especially in Athens. But what they, nobody could have predicted the damage that Christianity did to, to anything pagan, let alone anything featuring women so prominently yeah. like I mean it's just like I mean I'm not a fan of Christianity broadly but I still think it can't be overstated like just how much they fucked up yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah well, like because women they would have expected these these stories to be passed down like I think about that so much in terms of like just what we don't know you know like we have all of these myths and and they say all of these These things that so objectively, like you just look at them sometimes and you're like, there's just no way in hell that the women believed this, you know, like, like, what did they believe? What, you know, when, when they were packing all these Athenian women into the home and not letting them do anything else, like, what did they talk to each other about? Yes. Like, what stories did they tell their daughters only? And like, ugh, I just, yeah, I mean, I want to know so bad. I think about it all the time when it comes to like the Cycladic figurines yeah like just the I mean I feel like now there's like I don't even know if it's gotten worse or just how I learned it but like when I was doing my BA I mean like 15 years ago like I just remember that the they were so openly called like goddess figurines like and it was I was certainly taught in that time like in an archaeology course that that you know like it was it was pretty well uh, assumed that this suggested that you know before you know pre bronze age like yes. there was a matriarchal world like this yes. goddess worship worshiping world and it makes so much sense when you think about like the explicit explicit myths subjugating gaia and every other woman like yeah. you can you can read where they were trying to stamp that out after the men had taken power kind of you know yes but now I feel like I see them and it's just like well you know they might not be boobs they might not be women figurines like I just feel like I'm seeing like more alternative now than even what I learned a while ago which is just sort of surprising because usually things seem to be getting better but I still like to work off this idea that like yeah like I mean that whole of the region very likely worshipped a goddess just before they were writing things down for us to learn about you know but it seems so obvious to me that that's how it started that all of most of human history would have started that way before they started to try to kill each other and then realize that they could get an advantage over women through that like yes yeah there's this concept that um pre the last ice age the only bleeding that humans did was menstrual bleeding (laughs) wow that it was sort of this this pastoral like not pastoral sorry because it's tribal nomadic but it's this idea right. that they didn't they didn't even hunt to kill that they didn't even try to kill because there, there was so much food available yeah and then there's this idea that post the last ice age the bleeding became like masculine bleeding yeah um there's also been this old idea that men feel the need to bleed in order to connect to the divine because huh. women naturally bleed to connect to the divine Huh. And so I think people kind of sometimes throw that under the rug as like, ah, oh, whatever, you know, it's just natural, what, you know, bio- biology. But it's not about biology, actually. It's just about power. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and sort of magic, like they say, you know what I mean? The, the ability to use whatever you have to connect to this higher power and this higher power being more feminine.
I mean, people say, well, is God gendered? Well, no, okay, the divine may not be gendered, but a sacred feminine is still important to the development of, you know, nature, yeah. not just humans, right? Um, and so trying to say, well, God is not gendered, that's fine. But what about this idea of the sacred feminine that protects and nurtures and feeds us? And that ties into environmental issues and women's and everybody's issues, right? That to, to live sort of freely and you know, as part of a community. And so I think Artemis was, I would argue, one of the few goddesses whose sole purpose was to protect and watch over this aspect of existence, the natural. Yes, there's a couple others with the wildness and, you know, Demeter and Persephone, and there's a couple of others in that way. But she as being in the mountains and in the wild and in the, all the animals and then into the birthing. Like, I think that she plays a really, a role with action. She takes action in a lot of these things. And she's the only one that actually does not technically is not a mother. Is never gets married. I mean, they give her Apollo later on, blah, blah. Right. Because they had to give him her something. But it's fascinating to me that they didn't marry her off like they did almost everyone else. No, that's true. Right? I mean, it always is funny to me, the Apollo of uh, it all, because he's uh, just... It's very funny because I realize I have an email I have to respond to about how I need to talk about Apollo publicly. But Apollo is just really such a little <laughs> shit. Yeah, like, I have a whole, a whole episode called Why Apollo Sucks. I mean, yeah. And it got a lot of heat, let me tell you. People oh. were like... How can you like Artemis and be against Apollo? And I'm like, I'm perfectly comfortable, actually. Uh huh. <laughs> no, Apollo is the only god that I have ever. Well, maybe Zeus. Definitely <laughs> Apollo and Zeus, where I have actually had like angry, uh, like modern practicers of of Hellenism, like which is like fine, like worship the gods do whatever you need to do but like don't come tell me that apollo is going to come and i've had people threaten yes divine assault on me i could because imagine because i shit talked to zeus and apollo and i'm like okay you know what maybe just go look at the sources and then tell me if i'm wrong yes yes i'm not <laughs> like exactly yeah. yeah exactly yeah but this link to artemis is so interesting because he's so insufferable because he does so many bad things because it does feel like it is making them twins is like this way to make her less powerful they also yes. like they give him more things to be god of and then of course later we get you know when when he gets conflated with the sun and then and then you yes. have like he basically becomes like you know this all-powerful sun god in yes. addition to everything else like yeah it does feel like like it is a way to make artemis less yes and then the romans of course who keep him as is and then change artemis to diana she yeah sort of oh the goddess of the moon or whatever and you're like well hold on a second this goddess yeah. has so much power and so they slowly do try to diminish her. In speaking about artifacts and the word goddess, I am finding, I did a whole thing on, I went to this exhibit in Chicago. So part of my work is trying to find Artemis everywhere. So lately I found her in the Balkans with the Thracians, you know, not surprising, she's up in the wilderness. So there was oh, yeah, a situation. She would align with Thrace of course, so right? well. That, that, that feels totally good. Totally would. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so Artemis Bendis, you know, has sort of been something yes. I've been looking into and and writing about and so i went to this exhibit in chicago called what was it called something like the kings of the first kings of europe and, and I'm, a, I'm romanian so i was born up in the carpathian mountains and so i thought oh my god eastern european it's gonna be so cool i'm gonna go see a blah blah i go into the exhibit and the word goddess has been taken out of every representation in fact the very first thing you see is a circle of statues Got it like a uh, half bird, half women. You can see it's a bird face and women. And in the description, it says, um, this is a group of women sitting around in a circle. And I lost my shit. Like I lost it. So I did a whole, yeah. like, a, a whole episode with pictures, with evidence. Anyway, I did a whole thing because I was like, what? This is clearly bird goddesses. Clearly their faces are birds. I mean, yeah, you can't go call if they are half animal, you can't just go calling them women. Like oh, that's not how this works women? anywhere. Yeah. These all represent the women in the village. What? How do you know? These are like premiolithic pieces. How you oh. don't have any writing. So what? 
Yes. <sighs> I do think there is a backlash. Certainly there was one against Gimbutas, as we all know, for a long time. Against and which, Mo- sorry? Gimbutas, Maria Gimbutas, yeah. Oh, no. So she, Maria Gimbutas is this very famous Lithuanian archaeologist who did, I mean, she spoke eight languages. I don't know, she had three PhDs. She was super, super Badass. masterful. Yeah. yeah. And she wrote on artifacts. So she's an archaeologist by trade. And she was allowed to go in, like, in the back of museums and find all these statues. And basically she's saying, in short, there was a goddess culture. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of artifacts, some that are shown, some that are just thrown in the back of museums. And this is all about sort of matriarchy slash, I don't know, matrifocal, whatever word you want to stick in there, but it was female-centered. Anyways, as an academic, she got bashed in her time. She got bashed, bashed, bashed. But a lot of like first wave feminists, second wave feminists did take up her work and used it when they were, you know, working on other women's rights issues and other issues. And then she kind of disappeared for a while. And now I think there starts to be, well, I don't know if everyone would agree with about her disappearing but when I was doing my PhD for example I wanted to use a couple of her books because she does excellent artifact work drawings excellent oh wow so like the science of archaeology she does amazing yeah and my own a couple of my supervisors both of them females both of them women were like no you can't use her work like that's goddess stuff we don't want to do goddess stuff and this is what I got my PhD in 2016 so let's say yeah And so I had to cut, I still got to keep one of her books, but I had to cut a lot of scholars that were using the sort of goddess aspect out of my work because then it looked like it wasn't credible enough. Oh my God. And so I really, so when I finished my PhD, like my mother says, you know, once they give it to you, they can't take it from you. Yeah. (laughs) Fuck yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Right? I was able to like talk more freely about these connections. I mean, artifacts are artifacts and none of us really have any, like we have a methodology of how to identify them, but sure. no one can say a hundred percent. No, it's literally what... impossible. Right, like... exactly. Yeah. And so what I'm seeing now all over museums lately in the labels is that they take the word goddess out. They even sometimes take the, the gendered word out. They'll just be like, Ceramic figurine, I don't know, 3700 BCE. And you're like, and I'm okay with that to some degree. Like, you know, there has to be a balance between yeah. maybe leaning too much in one way, but I'm starting to, to see it as an erasure. And I'm thinking about young women who go to the museum who maybe know nothing about it, you know, anything. They're just young people going, or young people actually. And they don't use the terminology goddess, you know? Um, and how does that affect, you know, the future for us, for all of us, yeah. if we don't, right? Like, it is kind of problematic, and I don't really know exactly how to fight against that or defend against that, other than just talking about it as we are now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, I mean, and- that's something, though. The volume of people that are now talking about that kind of stuff, like, at the very least, that's, you know, it's encouraging. And I, I find it so encouraging, like... Because like again, like the, I, this entire the the fact that my podcast has become what it has when all I do is focus on the women and how shitty men were, like it blows my mind all the time. Like, really, I can confirm that hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people want to hear this, and like that's really cool. At least like people want to know it, so just yeah. like you know, giving it to them, I think is is so good yeah I agree I agree and I think it helps us to imagine like a space and probably that's why I feel so driven to create a space where women I mean we think about women in the patriarchy in the Greco-Roman times and yes they were very much subjugated but they also had these massive rituals just for themselves and these mass and like I think about it today like where would I go today to celebrate Artemis or a goddess where would I go today where it would be only in celebration of this divinity because yeah. like where do we have these spaces um and like regular you know monthly or yearly celebrations where we would gather where we would drink where we would dance where we would play you know whatever music we would have orgiastic rites, whatever that means you know because there's lots of fantasy around i get a lot of people ask me when you say orgiastic rites, <laughs> what do you mean and i think what they're asking me is were they having sex yeah you know and yeah. I'm like, 
Well, I mean, they could have because yeah. I don't think Greek men would have cared if women were having sex with one another. That, that is what I say far too often at this point. I feel like I'm becoming a broken record, but I have this like whole little fantasy world in my head where every time the men were like, you can't go out. You just have to hang around with your friends. The women were like, you know what? That's fine. Like my friends make me feel a lot better than you do. So like, cause I really do think that they not only like, I think that they wouldn't have seen it as sex because they were just so obsessed with like who penetrated whom Yes. You know, especially yes. in Athens and especially with the whole Erastes Aramanos with themselves, like yes. they just wouldn't have seen it as sex. They would be like, I don't know. My wife's like having a nice time with her friend. Like, I just yeah. think that's so joyful to be like, well, they were probably very satisfied at the very yes. least. Yes. Yes. I agree. I mean, that's the way I see it too. <laughs> uh, that's the way I see even the, you know, the main ads and all of any time that yeah. people say wild women in the forest, I think. Yeah, they were probably drinking, dancing, you know, chilling, doing whatever they wanted. And other than, I think, the men seeing that freedom as dangerous as yeah. far as thinking, right? Like yeah. women gathering, women thinking, women talking to each other about... Women getting drunk together. Right? Yeah. Right? Uh, but women talking to each other about, like, what is your husband doing? And what is your... Like, right? Like, men yeah. have always, I guess, felt in some way that that women are sharper, quicker, smarter, more cunning. Like there's all these words that are associated. And I think every time you see women gathering, even during the witch hunts of Europe, every time you see women gathering, women independence, women talking, uh, there's the, the authorities start to be suspicious of like, what are they doing? And it's really about power. Yeah. Um, you know, and is there a revel, you know, there's that fear of the, I guess the colonizer or the dominator who is like, oh, the, the people that we subjugate may be gathering to speak against us in some way or prepare yeah. against us, you know? Yeah. Now, for all we know, the women were just chilling, who knows, like just having a great time. Yeah. But I think not knowing caused that kind of threat, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And then you're right, drinking, partying, being naked in the wilderness, yeah. you know? Well, and I think it's not a coincidence that the only god deeply associated with that stuff is also the most gender fluid god in Dionysus mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. Dionysus is the least masculine god that's what makes him so interesting is that he was very happy to dress up like the women and and participate in all of these things and it wasn't about him being like the man in the situation like he was just part of it sure he was the divine one yes. but it wasn't about a div divine masculinity it was just about that he was divine. And I yes. think, yeah, like, I mean, I, 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 the, there's, you know, obviously like there's only little bits of like gender fluidity and, and like there are definitely trans stories in the ancient world, but I love all of those and just like how you can see them tying in to yes. the patriarchal norms and how like, I mean, some are threats and some are not. And it, it very much depends, I think, on the, where the masculinity is coming in to yes. that fluidity, but like, yeah, I mean, I just, I love that Dionysus is part of it. And then he's very much like, he's not part of it as a man. He's part yes. of it as just Dionysus, you know? Yes, yes. And I think Artemis is part of that threat because she always has an entourage of women. So they are all living in the wilderness, just hanging out with women and nature and animals and cute bunnies and cute deer. Being yeah. virgins. <laughs> That's an air quote. I mean, <laughs> I don't know that she, I, I'm very open to her having intimate relationships with her closest i mean if you think about it with callisto yeah in order for zeus to seduce her zeus has to transform into artemis so to me that has always been like well if you have to transform into artemis to seduce callisto that means that Cal and callisto is not surprised at all yeah that means that her and artemis are getting it on on a regular basis <laughs> yeah and yet like that's so not part of the story <laughs> like yeah no it's like this on... little detail yeah, yeah exactly exactly yeah. and then you know the focus is of course on artemis's jealous wrath and of all course. this kind of stuff that Calista's well because women are angry and jealous that's right that's right what they do that's right but i think about her and i think wow she was living like her best life because I'd l i wouldn't mind to live in the forest with a bunch of women um, when the you know, alternative how... is being a woman in Athens, like, yeah, yes. no, I am down. <laughs> like, take me to the forest, Artemis. <laughs> yes, yes. And then if a dude sneaks up on you, like Acteon, then, yeah. you know, she just, she is also actually a goddess that is quite unapologetic. 
Yeah. And, right and so she's swift i mean most a lot of the goddesses are quite swift with their vengeance um but she yeah she's totally unapologetic and she just well of course she tortures poor Acteon to death and punishes him for his transgression but that's also i think about consent right like yeah you, you're here without consent and so you're going to so in a way i don't know like sometimes i think there's a sort of um there's a bit of a paradox about what women must have felt like living in obviously patriarchy, but having these spaces that were for them as safe spaces away from, you know, patriarchal politics. Um, and Baran is definitely one of these places. Um, yeah. And they came as children. So you have that from when you're a very young woman. Yeah. Right. You must have come with your mother. You must have come with your sister for the rights. You must have come. Right. So there's this, long community and then as you're older and you're now let's say a wife and mother you come back and you come back um and so I think maybe that's why I like to come back and I like to go every time I go to Greece I go to Baran and just kind of sit there especially if it's like a nice fall winter day when no one's there and just kind of sit there and, and imagine what it would have been like when it's like just full of women and cooking and incense and whatever else you know was going on um, yeah. it's pretty powerful and then I think where do we have that in the modern day period I don't actually have a place like that yeah um, in, in modernity um, and so I feel like it's one of those something. things women often make it for ourselves though you know mm -hmm. like I mean just even just like getting together as yes. a bunch of girls like I feel like that's so common in my life and it, it kind of feels like its own way of of like kind of making up for that a little bit yeah 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 I think I think those are the only spaces where we where they're sort of social gatherings um I don't know if they have religious I mean I've been part of different groups like every now and then different groups will invite me to do a talk about Artemis different like goddess groups or wicked groups or whatever groups um and I really like those kinds of gatherings um but they're I, they feel a little bit few and far between compared to the regularity that was available in the ancient world yeah and, and pre-greek world even more so yeah you know maybe we're getting i mean i don't know now there's more and more so-called pagan temples that are going up um the greeks have finally allowed pagans now to be considered a real religion they just posted something this year or last the end oh. of last year where they were like, paganism is now acknowledged as a real religion in Greece. And so a lot of the people that are practicing pagan traditions in Greece are now coming forward more and more. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe we will see a revival of those kinds of spaces, not just for women, but for everyone who wants to participate. Yeah. You know, in those yeah. ways, that would be really incredible. Right. Yeah. Well, and I feel like, unfortunately, in the world that we currently live in, in most, I mean, the sort of in the the English speaking world that I'm, you know, most familiar with, with, at least, like, I think that now there is so much horrible transphobia that that's mm -hmm. all I think about when I think about, like, a quote unquote, women's only anything is I just immediately think of those people who don't want to open womanhood to people who weren't born into it and like it's just sad and gross and that like it's so hard because we have that that I feel like is so yeah like it's just like a it's we're just like in a different horror now it's true it, it's a it's it's a tough thing and actually I've talked to a few of my friends about this it's a tough thing because I feel like a lot of those let's say older women's spaces are holding on so tight to that yeah that it's becoming toxic in the in, in that way so, so i yeah. hope i hope that conversation and moving forward will be able to open up i mean the point of having these spaces is that everyone can join and yeah. participate yeah uh but it seems like the conversations that i get into every now and then they'll be like you know you fought so hard for the space and it's like yes but we fought for like the rights of everyone you know so yeah it's it's sad to me too sometimes because I like a lot of the pioneers uh, I, I mean they did a lot of work but you're kind of now adapting this patriarchal 
conservative structure and it's scary. It's really yeah. scary. You're like, so, so I agree. So again, another reason why I'd like to have space because I would really love to have everyone join and everyone be there in body, like in present, not Zoom, but like be there and maybe share and maybe worship the goddess and all those kinds of stuff. Um, yeah. And so that's sort of my vision for the future. It's open to everyone. But I know that we're in a weird space um, with those with those kinds of groups and, and that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So hopefully moving forward, we can maybe even, you know, for Women's Month. I mean, we got to we got to figure out, you know, how do we move forward together? Yeah. We must, like we have yeah. to. We have to. Yeah. yeah. I agree. It's so interesting. I, I've never really thought about it this way, but I, I, I'm not, I'm not a spiritual person. So I tend to like, especially when it comes to the show, like it, it tends to feature very much as like, this is like historical mythology to me. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with seeing it alternatively, but it's to me, like, I'm just not, yeah, not in that. But I grew up in a, I don't even know how to properly describe it. Like in an incredibly woman centric, spiritual group that sometimes when I talk about it and explain it too much it sounds like a cult so I don't (laughs) I don't believe it is actually a cult but it has a lot of qualities um but like I grew up like my mom was in it and like so I'm just kind of realizing having this conversation how much more I grew up around the concept of the goddess yeah than other people my mom (laughs) my mom still and like she's still in it I just don't like deal with it but my mom still every single time I'm with her in the car and she needs to find a parking space she will say out loud we're going to ask the parking goddess like like I, I just see I, I experienced things like, oh that was just like how I grew up and I realized that's super not normal um but like so yeah I'm like oh I think I grew up in like kind of almost like what a little bit it wasn't it wasn't explicitly to women but it was like 90% women in this thing so I'm like, oh, right. That was like not totally normal. But I definitely grew up with this like concept of the goddess, like everywhere all the time. <laughs> well, that's amazing. I mean, I grew up Catholic, so that was not really possible. But my I mom my was kids... Catholic, so then she did that instead, see? you see? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think my kids are growing up that way, though. I mean, I had put my kids in Catholic school for a little bit when they were young. And I got called in the principal's office because my son was telling his teacher that, um, the goddess created earth and the goddess creates everything. And they were like, and anyway, I pulled them out and put them in public school. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, I, so I love that idea. I love that for you, Liv. Like I, I, no, that was not. And in fact, this was the first year that I told my mother that I'm no longer celebrating Christmas and that I'm no longer considering myself a Christian. I mean, I haven't for a while, but I haven't said it out loud to my family. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I don't know how it went over and it's a work in progress, but yeah. So I grew up very much in the um, masculine world of, uh, yeah. God yeah. Well, I can see Jesus. Romania being very, yeah. a very different time. We were like from Quebec, more Catholic than the rest of the country, True, true but still true. Canada. <laughs> <laughs> true true i think it does affect you in some way when you grow up thinking of like using the word goddess like even when people say oh my goddess sometimes <laughs> i still go oh my god and then you know like just different things like that little things like that and you, you realize yeah. how ingrained in you uh, the patriarchy is yeah um, and now that i'm so i'm starting to adopt artemis also as a spirituality or certainly like the goddess, certainly in Crete where I feel a spirituality there. I don't know if it's all Artemis or there's much more archaic divinities there since there are other divinities there. Um, but now that I, there's that kind of battle within yourself of like my cerebral brain going, okay, like, is this real? Like, yeah, I know we're in a cave and I know you feel feeling feelings, but like, is it really like, can we document it? And so I'm in this weird transition space between the cerebral and the spiritual yeah with the goddess yeah 
But, you know, in a way, it's a bit of a blessing because I always saw myself as an academic and for life an academic. And I think there's something about this movement that when I published my book, women just came out of the woodwork and were like, oh, my God, I love art. And then we, you know, being invited to groups and having conversations. And so you're like, suddenly you're like, like you, like you're saying, like, I, suddenly I'm surrounded by women who are using this term goddess everywhere. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is where I want to live. This is where I want to be. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I just, I love all of this. I even remembering I in the group that my mom like was part of a lot when I was a kid. Uh, she even made a friend who had like changed her name to Artemis. Wow. So I like I'm realizing like oh there's like there's more collection connections than I'd ever like fully recognized because I think I grew up with them was just like no. Uh, <laughs> then I just became obsessed with Greek mythology. So did I go very far? Probably not. <laughs> Uh, and I think I have my own kind of like spiritual connection to it, but it is more about like this connection to like the history and the people mm. more so than the the like more explicit like divinity spirituality. But I think it is so interesting to look at like all the different levels that that can and do exist within that. Like, and it's just so about like, you know, people's personal, you know, choices and, and interests. And I don't know, I, I do. It's nice at, from the very least of just being like the world is becoming a little bit less and by the world I mean you know the west where I live but becoming a little bit less Christian <laughs> yes 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 you're right I would say that that's a that's a good assessment yes um I this summer I'm going to Greece and I'm starting to map all the Artemis temples in Greece Ugh. uh and so I'm doing this whole technical digital thing on Google and blah 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 and I, use, I want to use my own pictures and my own stuff and blah blah but one of the reasons why I'm doing that is because I want to be able to share like a visual representation of how popular these spaces were, how many of them there were. I guess in my mind, I want to sort of rebuild or reconstruct like what it would have been like in the ancient world to walk around. <sighs> right. And I mean, I, I mean, Artemis is my boo. And so I, I'm, I'm here for her. I can't do all. I can't do all of them. Yeah. <laughs> There's a ton. You throw a, you know, you throw a rock and you hit a devil. <laughs> so I can't do them all but I like this idea like I, I guess I like something tangible or visual at least so that people everybody can see what it must have been like to live in a space where you had so many options to worship yeah. right yeah um, so many personalities and that you could worship them simultaneously you know um, I don't know that we are, I mean, we, we talk about it and we can imagine it, but I don't know that we can really contextualize it. Maybe it takes a little bit to get used to that. Um, yeah. I mean, it's so different. It's so yeah. foreign, like right. in a, in yeah, such an interesting way. Yeah. 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 Oh, so I, it, so, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I know. So that's, so I think that's my, yeah, that's my, it's my passion, but it's also my goal. No. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I love it. And and now though, I desperately want to know, like, are there more, more like areas and temples devoted to Artemis where we know like kind of what, what happened? Like, I know we don't know a ton about what happened at Buran, but like, is there anything like that elsewhere that we know about? I mean, because it's men, we know at Sparta that. Yeah. Was, I was going to say, I do right? remember something at Sparta. Yeah. Right. That they used to whip themselves bloody and, and blood up her statue. I don't know if you know. Really? No. Yeah. Okay. So oh. in, let me tell you the story in short. Okay. So Thank it's you. Artemis Orthea and anybody who goes to Sparta, you can go see this temple. In fact, for a long time, I didn't even know that the Spartans worshipped Artemis because it's not something they really talk about. Yeah. But anyways, um, so there's this little temple. Well, it looks like a little temple now. And there are a couple of stories from different historians, but basically a priestess of Artemis would stand in the middle of a circle okay, yeah. holding a wooden statue of Artemis. Um, they say Arthea means she's erected or stands erect. So it's, it's not the hunter goddess. It seems to be more like the Artemis of Ephesus style of goddess, okay. but we don't know. We don't have a piece of it. Anyway, she stands in the middle holding this wooden statue and around her, all the Spartan boys that are about 13, 14 years old walk around whipping themselves. So self-flagellation, right? Yeah. Bleeding, bleeding and splashing the blood onto the statue. And obviously the priest is holding the statue. Yeah. So they do this in two ways. They do this, number one, until the last man standing. So that's one. And that's how they would gain sort of honor among the, the boys. Or... 
they do it until the sta- uh, until the priestess says, okay, the statue has drank enough blood, it's soaked enough in blood that the goddess is satisfied. And they say that actually this ritual <laughs> <laughs> is a replacement ritual to an earlier ritual of human sacrifice where a boy or a young man would be killed and his blood would be poured all over the statue. So they say that this was, I don't remember who says it, if it's Hesiod or some, someone else, um, that this was a replacement ritual. Instead of sacrificing one person, they decided to do it communally and spread and, and you know, whack, um, whip themselves, <laughs> whack themselves, yeah. whip themselves um, until the statue is soaked. And so I try to imagine that. So when you're in Sparta, the this most Spartan thing I've ever heard. That, like it's, it's <laughs> I try to imagine the priestess in the middle though, because she yes. must be coated in blood too. Right? It makes me think of Iphigenia among the Taurians. Yes. Well, yes, this is where it comes from. Uh, Artemis Orthea is very much connected to the Taurian Artemis. And they say that it's actually the same the same version of this of her that arrives in Sparta, and mm. then some some will say that they go from Sparta to Taurus, etc. Either way, there's a lot of bleeding and sacrificing on this statue. Yeah, so, yeah. So we know that one for sure because we have lots of male writers yeah <laughs> talk about it and I, it's not so secret it's actually a public ritual because you would honor your family by how long you could stand and bleed yourself well, of course yeah very right? sparta i knew yeah. about that temple but i did yeah. not know about those details <laughs> but i did know that there was like a big important temple to artemis in sparta <laughs> and like oh okay yes oh, yeah. yes the romans tell a story in which they turned it uh, they made it about cheese eventually they make them, there's a story like that they put cheese on the altar and as the boys are running to get the cheese they're whipped so whoever is able to oh. make it through this whipping cycle and get the cheese wins like this kind of games that i feel like i've heard more where it's more about like them scrambling for food and getting yes. punished but i didn't know about that in connection with artemis unless i yes. did i don't know i learned yes. too many things then they followed them yeah mind. so this is a later a li- so i guess they they sort of move away from the self whipping yeah. As the Romans, or no, once the Romans arrive, and so then they make it about food, but they're still getting whipped on the way to get the food. So there's still yeah. a, a sort of a bleeding aspect to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, so yeah. she's yeah, she's quite yeah. the bloodthirsty goddess, uh, particularly of course men's blood. She's she really enjoys their their bleeding and suffering. <laughs> yeah, but thinking about that in connection to the fact that she is this kind of like. She is a goddess of childbirth, but but I I mean I find her so interesting because she's this goddess of childbirth who is notoriously childless. Yes. And so thinking about yeah, men's blood, like you're saying earlier, like men's blood in connection with that. Yes. Is much more interesting, certainly. Yeah. yeah. I like this idea that she doesn't have children of her own. I think that Same. idea really changes with the Virgin Mary because then she has children, so she becomes this mothering and yet artemis is a mothering divinity without actually birthing from her body i love that idea i think there's a complexity yeah. there um that patriarchy doesn't allow for like patriarchy goes oh you're a mother if you birth well yeah. actually that's not true um and so i well, really like that about her yeah i mean there there are so many really interesting hold they feel like holdovers mm. um from this from the the sort of the goddess worshiping time period that came before probably came before um like they feel like so many goddesses feel like holdovers in that way like hestia artemis athena like they all have different in like points and like obviously artemis is the most kind of in your face because she is also a goddess of childbirth but like these these goddesses that that are quote-unquote virgins but it you know we now have this association with that word about like it, it, it just has this Christian association, right? Yeah. Like the Virgin Mary, you know, she's a virgin, but hers is about being pure. It's about being, you know, whatever all those different things are. I don't know not a lot about Christianity. It's great. Um, but like, whereas the, the goddesses, you know, from Greek myth, it's more about them being unmarried. It's about them yes. being like, them, they don't have a husband. And like, yes, they also don't have children, but it's not about purity, Yes. It's about like marital status. And I do think that's, it's something that I didn't really like realize when I first started doing this because 
the, everything you read just uses the word virgin. And then we just put this connotation on it, but it's like yes. that, that the Parthenos originally meant more like unmarried. Yes. It's just so much more fucking interesting. And I feel like it yes. doesn't get said enough unless you're like in these, you know, deep and, you know, much more academic kind of circles with this like greater understanding of the context. I just, yes, absolutely. yeah, I wish more context existed when you're talking about any of this stuff. Absolutely. It's, like, it's not about purity. It's not about like, no. some hymen in there. Like it's not about that. And you know, what's interesting is that there's a lot of rumors and I say rumors because they haven't been archeologically or historically evidenced, but there's a lot of rumors, let's say in conversations among academics that pre patriarchy goddesses like Hera, Athena, Artemis um, had the skill or had the ability of parthenogenesis. Mm -hmm. And so there, that there's this rumors that inside the temples that the priestesses knew secrets whatever they may be, that they had these secrets that could allow women to become pregnant with female daughter with daughters. I want to say magically, but without the association, you know, without the help of a man and the way that Hera yeah. gives birth to Hephaestus or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so, and what's fascinating is, I don't know if you've seen the stingray, that sort of self impregnate, you know, the parthenogenetic stingray. Okay. I've seen the pregnant stingray. Oh I didn't God. know it was parthenogenetic yes. and that's yes. why it's interesting. Thank you. I was like, why do we care about a pregnant stingray? Thank you. That's vital information. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I, I just, I'm fascinated with her because it's like, so she was all, no stingrays are around, just these sharks. And in the beginning, people are like, oh, maybe she's going to have shark babies. It's not possible for her to get pregnant on her own. Yeah. Now they're actually using that word, like on TikTok and social media and news. They're using the word parthenogenesis. And as a historian, I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah, that's so <laughs> exciting. I'm like, oh, I know that word. Not in modern context normally, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly you know and so and so that's kind of exciting because it's sort of like scientific yeah that this is a natural occurrence now I'm not saying that like I said there's no evidence that women were you know yeah but there's lots of stories like Gaia and Hera and other stories in which goddesses do reproduce let's say oh yeah I mean there's it's countless like, like there's so many parthenogenic yeah. goddesses and it's yeah but they're just, they're immediately subjugated. And like, that's like yes. usually by their child. And so, yes. and also the child are, children are usually men. Oh, yes. okay. Interesting. <laughs> yes. Now I'm thinking about so many things when it comes to that. Like, okay. I, I, I'm going to have to rack my brain later and see if there is a parthenogenetic child that it does not immediately subjugate their mother. But yes. regardless, there are so many. And it is really interesting that, but yeah, I mean, it, you can just kind of see how these stories were transformed, right? Yes. How so something existed in yes. the, the prehistoric time that then when the stories that we now have were written down, whatever, like they were, whether intentionally or otherwise, but like making these changes to benefit the current world order, the patriarchy. Yes. yes. And, and that leads to the double goddess theory. And the idea that, so there's a couple of questions. First is why do we have so many stories of Parthenogenetis goddess? It doesn't make any sense if they had already, if there wasn't something mysterious happening before, number one. Yeah. Number two is we have this double goddess. And in archaeology, we have these kind of blocks with two heads. And for a long time, there were mysteries, you know, and lots of scholars today, well, it's about three, uh, talk about how these are possibly mother-daughter statues. So the idea that mother-daughter share a womb, that mother-daughter share secrets, that mother-daughters hmm. pass down uh, mysteries. And so this, imagine this world in which a goddess parthenogenetically creates a daughter through which she communicates history, ritual, story. That daughter then parthenogenetically connects another, and this idea, this sort of this magical, fantastical story. But it seems that we have partial obsession, partial repetition of these kinds of stories in the ancient world that remain unexplained. Like, why did the ancients tell us so many of these stories? Why do we have so many double goddess things? And um, perhaps because women kept lots of secrets or didn't write things down, we don't really have an explanation for that. Um, well, but it's, I think it's also, I mean, and uh, I'm sure it's just your, your phrasing, but I want to point it out to my listeners that like, they might've been writing them down, but if they did, they didn't get copied for us to uh, have them. Right. Yes. Like 
it's very likely or possible at least that they wrote a yes. ton of stuff down True. but that stuff doesn't naturally last and so yeah like unless somebody's out there being like this is worthy of my copying my transcription to keep it alive which like yes. obviously they would never do if it was all about women because Christianity yes, no, came right. in and fucked everything up yeah <laughs> no you're absolutely right I mean that's a very good point I mean like we only have Sappho's little pieces but exactly certainly if Sappho was participating why wouldn't others well, exactly. And we have her little pieces, yeah. mostly, as far as I know, but I haven't looked that deep, uh, because of like random survival, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, yes. like, oh, the papyrus was used for something else. So we have it. And that's why she's so damn fragmentary. That's right. So like, if anything, Sappho is this like incredible example yes. of how women wrote stuff down and why we don't still have it. Yes. Oh. Yeah, that's actually maybe a little more tragic in a way, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's true. That's a little more. And I mean, I mean, we haven't discovered everything, so yeah, it's possible that somewhere, somehow, we may come across some other pieces. But yeah, you're right. I mean, if the value of those things were not see, it was not observed, then we have lost um, a lot. And you know, that repetition or someone overhearing somebody talking and then writing it down and things like that. Again, we get it through men's eyes a lot. Mm -hmm. And so we don't, that is part of the frustration, I think, of being, of looking back in history is that we have not yet found all the documentation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think about it all the time because I am deeply obsessed with Euripides in large part because I think he thought women were people worthy Mm -hmm. of (laughs) Mm -hmm. describing as such. Um, But how like, You know, so many of his plays we only have, again, because of like this random occurrence, not because they were deemed worthy. And so and, and, you know, in some of the cases, like I think the Helen being one of them, like it's a really interesting like way to look at both what they found to be worthy Mm. of survival back then. But like for lots of different reasons, right? Like the most obvious being that the Helen makes Helen not to blame for the Trojan War and so like there's not going to be a lot of support for that because it's really nice to blame the Trojan War on Helen yes but then also because it's a it's a play where Menelaus looks like a little dweeb and Helen saves everyone and like I don't do you know offhand if 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 I among the Torians is one of the alphabet plays because I could see it being one and I know it's in the right yes yes yeah because it's in the right letters (laughs) yeah because because like yeah I mean that's another one where like (laughs) <laughs> Orestes and Pilates are like complete dweebs who can't do anything yes. if if Iphigenia isn't there to help them. Yes. Like those two plays are so similar. I just recently like finished the Taurians after not having read it for so long, so it's sort of in my head, but I mean, yeah, I just think about that with everything. Like cuz we also do know that there were other women poets, like we know their names, but we don't tend to have much that survives yes. if anything. Like Yes. <sighs> yes. Yes, I and mean, you're right. You're absolutely right, actually, because women entered competitions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we know that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that like makes I, it even more tragic now that I think of it, that we don't yeah. have. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I can name a couple that I've heard of, of like, like Sappho, but whose work just doesn't serve. Like, I feel like Arina is one and there's a P. Anyway, mm-hmm. I know I have a book about it. <laughs> but like, yeah, it, yeah it's, it's just so interesting to to really look at the stuff that, we know existed, but we don't have, let alone everything that we don't even know if it existed because it probably featured or was written exclusively like by women. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's part of one of the obstacles that we are hoping to overcome um, with new digs. I mean, I'm going on a, I'm going to a dig, not on the dig in Eritrea where uh, there's a temple to Artemis that's being exca- excavated now. And they found some statuettes and things like that. But I'm always hoping for inscriptions. I'm always hoping for little pieces of writing. Um, they're still digging, so it'll take a few years. But who knows? Like, so, th- so those are some of the pieces that we could then, I mean, again, I mean, it would be a small piece, but it would be something that would give yeah. us some ideas. Um, so far, all we've done is we found her name on lots of pottery and lots of pots and, and maybe some. Uh, like so when I go into museums sometimes especially the museum at Buran they have a whole wall where they have just shards just shards of I don't know the thousands of pots and things that were there with her name and so they've selected the shard with her name and they put it on the wall and I just stand there sometimes and I'm like oh look at how many times they wrote her name yeah (laughs) I love stuff like that so much I also just have like a real obsession with like regional Greek museums because 
they're always like the lowest budget museum you've ever been into, but they have the coolest stuff. And I love the combination, like no notes. They're just so fun. It's true. It's true. My only frustration with places like Piraeus, for example, is that they have these massive uh, artifact spaces and then no labels. And it drives me a little bit. (laughs) No labels. And then also like, I swear nine times out of 10, like something's closed. Like I've been to Delos, I guess only I've been to Delos twice. But yes. both times the museum has been closed. Yes. And I know it's because they're working on it, but I want them to open it. Or I went to Samothraki, which was like quite an effort. Yeah. <laughs> and the museum was like mostly closed. I mean, I, I yes. did get a tour by the archaeologist, so I probably shouldn't complain. I knew people, but like yes. still, you yeah. know, like, just, but anyway, yeah. The, the stuff you find are those little ones. And now though, I'm obsessed with going to, to Broron. So yes. is it like, I don't, I'm a dumbass and I don't have a driver's license. Is it easy to get to? I'm going to look into it Without now. I'm going to Greece soon. Yeah. You are. I, heard, I saw that you're going on a trip with, with people and stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. That, that's, that's exciting. <laughs> Ooh, I keep kind of forgetting about that because I'm afraid of being the center of attention. Uh, but that is part of it. But I'm going to be there like a, probably almost a month and a half um, so that I can be there for those 10 days with all of those people and then also have all that time alone to nice, nice. explore. <laughs> I would say you, I would say you'd have to drive to it. Uh, yeah. You could take the bus, but then you have to walk. Yeah. Well, I yeah, mean, walking's okay. not bad, oh, but I would say like about a two kilometer walk. Kind oh, of. that's not bad. I can yeah. do that. Yeah. All right. I'm taking yeah. notes. I, I need to add more like places. I, I've been like trying to mark it all. I'm trying to see everything. And so, yeah, I got to add some to the list. I keep just yeah. going back to Naxos because it's the greatest place in the world. It really is wonderful. Yeah. yeah. It really is. <laughs> oh, but I could use more Artemis. I like now I'm going to be way more obsessed with her, I think. But I just I think she is one of the goddesses who is kind of most affected by by the patriarchy, by the way that we are way the way that we can view her without having the like the deep knowledge that comes with like years and years and years of study, right? Like, like even the stuff I can find and I am, you know, at this point considerably more well-versed in, in looking for this stuff and in the ancient sources specifically, like compared to just, you know, any old person. But at the same time, I still like, am so limited by the ancient sources Mm. because, and they were just dudes. So I can do all my thinking about like what they didn't say or what got lost or whatever. And I do, but you know, like unless you're in academia, often you just can't get deeper, and that sucks. So this is my goal. To. So and so and this is my goal with the Artemis Center. But also, I think you're right. I think one of the ways that I find Artemis is easy to understand is more through artifacts. Mm. Um, mm. And yes, yes. You mentioned Artemis of Ephesus, mm-hmm. and I realize I really wanted to bring that up. Uh, <laughs> so I just think you said artifacts, and now we have to at least just quickly talk about. About the many boobed Artemis. Oh my gosh. Like, I'm obsessed. Okay, Liv, we have to do a whole thing. Because <laughs> I'm writing, so this is the book that I'm writing now is on Artemis of Ephesus. Uh, she was part of my dissertation. And now I have like, I don't know, a bunch more chapters. But yes, so uh, my argument has always been that those are actually queen bee cells. And they're queen bee eggs. And I have all wow. this evidence. All this evidence. <laughs> Like all this evidence, photographical evidence, and all this kind of evidence, and blah, blah, blah. And she actually just started getting boobs once Christianity and European male artists started doing that. Um, so, yeah, so those are not breasts. Well, I don't think they look like them. They look like them to us, but they don't look like them in terms of ancient statuary. And they have like no they... nipples. Like, there's don't no they? Nipples. No, oh, there's okay. no nipples on any no, of the ancient copies yeah i mean we don't have the originals but we have some roman copies yeah i was gonna say i saw one for the first time in person i went to the capitoline museum in rome in january Mm -hmm. and they have one there and it's interesting because they also low like i mean even nipples aside they don't look like the way that they sculpted breasts in the ancient world yeah so if you google queen bee cells just simple google search you will find a way because queen bee eggs uh are longer and they have a shape and you'll find a way that they they sit on the hive i don't know how to explain it yeah Uh, so yeah so this is my new like i have so much to say about her and atragartis and all these kinds of things that are connected to her anyway it's a long story but yes she is she's very special um she's so much more than a hunter goddess and she's so much more than everything she's very very special yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, well, i might 
I might have to bring you back to talk about her and especially in related relation to Adar Goddess because I've never I don't know enough about beyond Greek sources to like feel like I could do anything justice but I always want to know yeah so yeah yeah no she's she's really amazing and and my argument or my thought process has been you know why Artemis like why the name are like okay we know yeah. why historically but also there's something there's lots of layers there is what I mean that would have made that the perfect fit um, and they actually just found something in Ephesus that is a small statue of the mistress of animals. And we can trace the mistress of animals back to Crete. And now I've, well, Crete is my place. Like, it feels like home and I'm I obsessed mean, Crete with it. Crete is amazing. It is amazing, right? Uh, and so, and so I'm, I'm hoping to live there eventually since I have my EU passport and leave Canada. <laughs> Jealous. <laughs> I'm like watching, I'm looking at Greek places. I won't lie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, once you're, so... So there's this, there's this really multi-layered aspect of Artemis of Ephesus that I think really embodies her, her complexity. And, um, and I think it's time we talk about her as well. Like, I think that there, that it's time that we bring to light the way that ancients worshipped in these multi-layered, complex ways that I think we have really um, shrunk down or we've created these one-dimensional, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, especially even just the mythology, like yeah. worship broadly, absolutely. But like, I mean, I think about it with the mythology all the time because, and you know, if you're not deep in this, you pick up a book and you get a completely skewed view yes. of what it is because it is almost impossible to contextualize it all in a way that is like, you know, complete and not bogging down everything so like I understand but at the same time like you go to a store and you just pick up a book called Greek myths even if it's by like you know a a scholar of all of this stuff and it's still like if you're just reading a quote-unquote retelling of the the myths themselves like you are not getting the context of how many centuries were happening within these stories and how much they would have changed and been like regionally specific. And like, yes. you know, everyone just has kind of has to like pick a version and go with it. And it's why I think my show has become both very detailed and maybe sometimes annoying. I don't care. I'm not going to stop, but like, I will always tell all the different versions and I will never pretend that like, there's one answer to anything. There is no, there's no like, canon i've been reading i've been doing a lot of research on medusa for a book that i'm working on and yes (sighs) i mean medusa is like my pet she's my artemis like but yeah i mean the the medusa the the, trying to contextualize her stories trying to pick out a cut and dry version like is so impossible and i just keep reading the word canon in a bunch of places and i'm like who's canon like what are we yes i've read twice now some very like su- supposedly like fancy academic works referring to a pseudo Polydorus as a canonical version of her story. No. I guess, right? I'm like, why though? Why? Like, I don't think that we should ever be calling anything in Greek myth canon. Yes. But if we have to, for some strange reason, pseudo Polydorus is not it. No. No. Like, I'm, I, anyway. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, uh, academia sometimes can be a little out of touch um, with some things, and yeah, it's still yeah. a it's still a field. <laughs> I don't know what to say about my, no, I my get fellow it. colleagues. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, and, and I like yeah. the the work that was most annoying to me. I have this like I just found it at some used bookstore, but it's like the Oxford Dictionary or a, like encyclopedia of of Greek and Roman oh, myth, no. of classical myth, and oh. yeah, and I was like not going to use it as a main source, but like at least for like an inspiration for where else to look. But then it says, one, it's, it calls Pseudo Apollodorus canonical. And then two, says that Medusa is linked with this Mesopotamian goddess who I'd never heard of. Then I Googled it and even Google can't agree with that at all. And instead links her to like a different Mesopotamian divinity. Anyway, it was very interesting and only confused me more than when I yeah. started. But <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny the stuff you find. And then I just think about people who don't have the background knowledge that I have finding that stuff. And you just are like, this is the right answer, you know? And yes. that's just, yes. it's too bad. <laughs> yes. Yes. And you know, now you say that Liv, part of the reason why I started the school and I did, I have this, these courses that are like little courses called goddess essentials. One mm-hmm. of the reasons why I started that is because exactly this people would come to me and be like, 
oh, what do you know about Hecate and like what's true and what's not true? Or what do you know about Aphrodite and what's true and what's not true? And I thought to myself, yeah, like how, if you don't want to do a whole degree and you shouldn't have to, yeah, right? like, come on, how do you look up a source and be like, here's something that tells me about primary source, secondary source, contextualizes it a little bit, but it's short enough that I can do it and I can get it. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do some of them, not all of them, but I'm going to do like 10 goddesses so that if people are like looking for where do I start, you can find that because that has been my problem too. Is like you go digging for something, you fall down the rabbit hole, but then you also find so much stuff that's like, what, where did you get this from? No, this is, hold on, wait, what? And then it creates this chaos. Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. I mean, even in just like this, I've only been working on this Medusa piece for a little while, but like the number of places that without any kind of explanation or or like context at all say with their whole whole mouth like the greek myth of medusa is and then they just proceed to tell the version from the metamorphoses and i'm like there is nothing wrong with the version in the metamorphoses but it is explicitly and <laughs> categorically not the greek myth of medusa like yes St- just yeah. I it has value yes. but it doesn't have value as being the Greek myth of Medusa yeah that happened not. to me with that happened to me with Apollo because I had said something about him being a total douche canoe and somebody had said to me using the metamorphosis oh well you know he only learned about this later or he only did this and I had to do a whole little spiel about like Roman history is not Greek history and it comes after uh you know Greek history and it you know it rewrites the stories however they want and it's fine mm-hmm. but you know anyways yeah. So that, so you're absolutely right that, um, and I mean, in all fairness, like how not everybody should have to get a degree to understand, no. like we need no. to have a space that's just, that's more clear and more easy to access and that people can just learn what they need to learn and feel confident that, okay, I've got the basics and I can go out there and make whatever connections might feel fun for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so maybe we're on our way to that, but maybe we're just, you know, maybe this is the movement that's happening now, right? Because for a long time, of course, this was gatekeeping. There was a lot of great gatekeeping around classics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So now less so. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. It's getting yeah. better at least. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, well, I clearly could talk about this forever, but I will not yeah. keep you forever. But I would love if we could, if you have got a couple extra minutes, um, yeah. just finish off by telling people where they can find more about, like, the project you're working on your podcast like l- literally anything you want to share about artemis and yourself yeah so social media is artemis expert um and nice then, and easy i love that and, one. <laughs> yeah. and i had to think about it for a long time and i had my one of my phd supervisors going well aren't you the artemis expert who else is working on artemis in the world academically and i was like well actually no one is really working on her and he's like okay well then just take the name and be great you know yeah um, so I, so I like that. And then the Artemis Center has a whole website. Uh, the Goddess Project is my podcast. Um, also born out of this idea that I wanted to talk about goddesses the way I wanted to talk about them. And sometimes when I teach at the university, we have to stick to like dates and names of emperors and things like that. So I was like, no, let's talk about <laughs> rituals and all the gory bits. So the Goddess Project is, yeah, as the podcast. And yeah, that's about it. Otherwise, you can probably find me through those three things, those three places. Yeah. wonderful i'll link to yeah. things in the episode description too so they can find it but this was thank so you. much fun thank you so much for doing this thank you Liv. i've been looking forward to meeting you for so long I love oh my god same you're doing. i love it oh, thank love you it. Love i love it and <laughs> talking with people makes me love it so much more and i needed that today specifically so thank you this was very Aww. fun <laughs> that makes me feel good thank you Aww. Oh, as always, thank you all so much for listening. I just, I mean, I I have been having a tough go of it lately. <laughs> just now? <laughs> Withheld tears long enough that I could record this. We're doing great. Uh, you know, I, I started talking and I had nowhere to go. Honestly, thank you all so much for listening. Thank you all for the really kind notes that you've sent me to when it comes to the utter disaster of a human that I am in this moment while trying to put out incredible content that I've been so excited about for months. Like I have had these episodes planned for months and months, i.e. since before 
everything I loved exploded in my face and died. Um, And so it's been really hard to feel like I had these ideas that I was so excited about and these people I was so excited to talk to, or in some cases, people I'd talked to before and like, oh, anyway, there's been tough moments. Um, But it's been, you know, really tough to, to try to create this content and, and put it out when I have this, this like deep desire to do it, but also an inability to function as a human being official depression setting in um we're looking into it but in the meantime i just really appreciate the supportive nature of my listeners and i just you know thank you thank you for not once complaining about this show being a little bit more haphazard lately and just you know thank you for being really nice and lovely uh and That's all I've got to say, actually. Let's talk about Miss Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians, my assistant producer. Laura Smith, again, no relation. I think it's funny every time I have to say their names back to back. Like, come on, guys. Really? In any case, Laura Smith is the wonderful audio engineer and production assistant. The podcast is part of the iHeart Podcast Network. Listen on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, if you are interested in supporting this show or me or just all the work that I do and you get to listen to for free, I'm not trying to guilt you, I promise, but it's just like factual. Um, you can subscribe on Patreon and contribute to the show. There is a ton of back bonus content for you to binge. Honestly, like I can't even, I don't even know how many episodes. It's pretty wild how much I've put out in seven years of having a Patreon. And I say all of that because I've not been very prolific lately. I haven't been able to do anything Um, because, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm barely here. But there is so much if you want to contribute to the show. It's patreon.com slash mythsbaby. And if I let myself continue to talk into this microphone without a script, it's just going to go poorly. Thank you all so much. You're truly wonderful. I really, truly, honestly could not keep doing this without you. That's a, that's a straight up fact. I am Liv and I love this shit. Mm-hmm.